All right, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on BC 110, Identity, Who We Are in Christ. There's a question on the chat uh, that we'll look at. It says, is it possible that anointing is not proportional to the heart attitude? That is, in a flourishing ministry, can commitment to God still not be true? Um, the answer is yes. Um, so we need to recognize uh, Romans chapter 11, Romans 11, 29. Romans 11, 29, it says, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Or a modern version would put it, God does not change his mind on whom he calls and whom he anoints. So the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So, you know, God had called somebody, anoint somebody. Uh, that's because he chose to do that. But the heart attitude of that person is dependent on that person. That person could be genuinely committed or that person could you know just uh, I mean yeah enjoy the gifting enjoy the calling enjoy the anointing and the grace that God has put on that person's life uh, and but if they're not you know true to that commitment it's possible that they could do things that you know destroy the call of God destroy what God wants to do through that person, right? So the gifts and the calling of God are given by God. Our heart, our character is something we offer to God. And we become co-workers with God, right? That's why Paul writes in you know, 1 Corinthians 9, I think it's verse 27. He says, I discipline my body and I keep it in subjection, lest... When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You know? So he says, look, think about this. Paul, he's anointed, he's gifted, called by God, he's planted churches, written epistles, done lots of things. And yet he says, I discipline my body and I keep myself in subjection. That means, you know, I have to take care of myself before God. Lest when I have preached to others, I can minister to others wonderfully, powerfully, I could become a castaway. Yeah? So there is that, our responsibility, our commitment, our hard attitude, our responsibility. From God's side, there is the anointing, the grace, the gifting, the ministry he gives us that is there. So, so that answer, I hope that answers your question. Um, we looked at Romans 11.29 and also 1 Corinthians 9. I'll give you the exact verse. I think it's verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Yeah, verse 27. All right. Okay. Let's go back to our uh, lesson here. Let me share the... Um, So, lesson number 28, page 52. We'll be looking at these two verses. Hebrews 10, verse 10, that we have been sanctified. Hebrews 10, verse 14, we are being sanctified. Okay. So, there is the completed work and there is the continuing work that's happening in our lives. You know, both are true. That we are sanctified and we are also being sanctified. So the being sanctified part uh, is, is what we want to talk about a little bit. Colossians 1 verse 22 says, In the body of his flesh through death uh, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So he's, he's working in us to present us holy and blameless 
and above reproach in his sight. So there is this whole process which God works in us and uh, uh, this, this being sanctified, this sanctification or this process of being sanctified is basically God's holiness, that's lesson number 39, God's holiness reproduced in us. So we must understand that God wants his nature and his character to be reproduced in us. God is love, so he teaches us to walk in love. God is holy, so he teaches us to walk in holiness. So sanctification is God's holiness being reproduced in us. His nature being reproduced in us. So that's what we, we, uh, we are in the journey of. Oh, you know, God, you make me holy. You help me to live holy day to day in all the things that we face. It's God's holiness or God's nature reproduced in us. And how does this happen? Lesson number 40. We are sanctified by the word and the spirit. So two things very important. God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit. That is how we are being sanctified. That's how the holiness of God is reproduced in us, by His Word, by His Spirit. And that's why it's so important for us to, you know, to read the Word, meditate in the Word, listen to the Word, you know, open our lives to the Word of God and open our lives to the work of the Holy Spirit. Two things we have to learn how to do. Open our lives to the Word of God, read your Bible, meditate in the Bible, uh, apply the Word of God to your life. Because through the Word, we are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, you help me. Holy Spirit, you help me overcome the weakness of my flesh. Right. So the Word of God renews our mind. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength to overcome the weakness of our flesh. Okay. So that's how we're going to learn to live out uh, this sanctified life or being sanctified. So we see there in Ephesians 5, verse 26, what is the Lord Jesus doing in the church? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So how is Jesus cleansing his church? How is Jesus cleaning the church? By washing it with the word of God. That's why the preaching, the teaching, the ministry of God's word is so important. Because it's through that word that he cleanses, he washes the church. The church meaning you and me. We are all part of the church. And by his word, we are being washed, sanctified. Okay. So, lesson number 41. Our call is to live the sanctified life in Christ. We must live like this. Live as sanctified people. So how do we practically do it? We will consider uh, a few aspects here. First of all, we must possess our vessel in holiness and honor. That means your way, our vessel is this body. Right? That means we hold, we keep this body in holiness and honor. That means you treat your own body, you hold your own body, in holiness and honor. So don't abuse your body. So, for example, we talked about, you know, somebody smoking. So he's not honoring his own body. He's actually destroying his own body. Because he's doing something that is hurting the body. So Bible is telling us, hold your vessel, this body, you keep it. In holiness and honor. So to practically live out this life of holiness or the sanctified life, we need to hold our body in holiness and in honor. Treat your own body as a holy vessel and treat it with honor. Okay. So let's read First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. You all with me so far? Yeah. Okay, it says, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus 
that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. It says, okay, and this is how you should walk. This is how you should live. This is how you please God. Verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. But this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So this is God's will, your sanctification. God has already sanctified you in Christ. Now he wants, it's his will for you to live like that, your sanctification. And that you stay away from all forms of sexual immorality, from all forms of sin. Verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel. That means your own body. How do you hold your own body in sanctification and honor? Right? So we must all learn how to do this. That each of you should know how. So learn how. And we're going to learn as we keep going through this course. We're going to learn how. And there's a course on holiness in, in our second year. We will we'll again learn more once, once again. But we must know how. We must learn how to possess our own vessel. This is our vessel, the body. How to possess this vessel in sanctification. That means in holiness and in honor. So we learn how to possess. So let's say this together. I hold my body as a vessel in holiness and honor. That means you look at your body as a holy vessel and you treat your body with respect, with honor. Right? That verse 4, that each of you should know how... Yeah, verse 5. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. That means, you know, don't live just fulfilling the lustful desires, the evil desires. The Gentiles who don't know God, they live like that. Don't follow their example. Right? That no one should... Take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Don't cheat one another in this. Don't abuse one another in this. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. God has called us to a life of holiness. So we need to hold our vessel um, this way. We need to walk, secondly, we need to walk in love, to walk in holiness. Think about this. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we to do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So look at these two verses, you know, how they're connected. He's saying in verse 12, you must increase in love. Increase in love to other people, one another. And what will be the result? Verse 13, so that your hearts may be established blameless in holiness. So think about it. If you walk in love, you will walk in holiness. Why is that? Because then you will not do anything. If, you walk, if, we, if we walk in love, then we are not going to do anything that would hurt somebody else. Correct? If we walk in love, we won't do anything to hurt the other person. So you, be, you walk in love, you're bound in love, so that your heart may be established in holiness, blameless in holiness before God. I won't do this to that person. So walking in love will help us walk in holiness. So you always think, I'm about to do something. Is it an expression of love to the other person? Would love do this? Someone was cheating something, hurting, doing something that might hurt the other. No, no, love won't do it. And so, then you don't do it. You walk in holiness. Right? So walking in love enables us to walk in holiness. Okay. So always think about that. 
you know, uh, uh, is this an expression of love to the people around me? And uh, uh, then that will help us, you know, stay in a place of holiness. And then number three, our standards and values are in line with the holiness of God. Sanctified standards and values. So our standards and values are not according to the world's. Not according to the Gentiles who don't know God. But our standards and values are according to what, what is in line with the holiness of God. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right? So he's saying, you present your body as a living sacrifice. Next lesson, the next chapter, our next section, we will learn about that. Now, how we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And as we do that, and we are renewed in our minds, what will happen? We won't be conformed to this world, but we will be transformed. The way we live will change. As we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and as we're renewed in our minds, the way we live will change. Okay? So Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you can memorize that, that'll be good. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It tells us to do two things. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Second, renew your minds. Renew your mind. What will happen? You will be transformed. How you live will change. We're going to learn how to do these two things, okay? But he's giving us the key. How are you going to be changed? How are you going to live that sanctified life? How are you going to show uh, the fact that you have been sanctified in Christ? How are you going to live from there? Present your body as a living sacrifice. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. We will come back to these two things in the next lesson, next section. But please memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. Right? So, a sanctified life, this is next page, page 56. A sanctified life will reveal his virtues. That means people will see the virtues, the qualities of Jesus. His love, His kindness, His compassion, His humility, His grace, His truth, His purity. They'll be able to see that in you and me as we live a sanctified life. And that's what we are called to. First Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Proclaim the praises. That word praises is virtues. That means you may show forth the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay. And then, as we uh, live the sanctified life, we become those vessels that God can use. Right? So this is important. That as we choose to offer ourselves in holiness to God, then he makes us vessels that he can use for every good work. And so living a sanctified life is so important. Second Timothy 2, 19 to 21. Verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from whatever is evil, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So if you and I want to be used by God for every good work, what must we do? We must cleanse ourselves from whatever is evil, dishonorable, and we will be vessels of honor. Now, there will be persecution and ridicule for being sanctified. That means people are going to... Uh, you know, persecute us, make fun of us, they're going to be hated, we're going to be hated. 
Uh, Jesus warned us about that in John 17, 13 to 19. He, he, in his prayer, he, he made mention of that. And uh, Paul also writes in you know, 2 Timothy 3, 12, uh, that all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. This is page 57. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Be it all together? Yeah. All who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So don't think that, oh, just because I'm living a holy life, everybody will come, Thali Baja, you know, clap for you, do namaskar. No. Just because you and I live holy lives, he says we will suffer persecution. People will, you know, mock us, make fun of us. We will face hardship, face difficulty because you're choosing to do what is right in everyday life. So those who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. And I think there's a last point here in this. Uh, uh, that God himself is sanctifying us completely. First Thessalonians 5, 23. Paul is, you know, he's, 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 he's speaking a blessing over the believers. He says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So you pray this for yourself. God, sanctify me completely. Let's do that. Just say this. Oh God, sanctify me completely. Spirit, soul, and body. Let it be blameless before you. So pray this for yourself often. Lord, sanctify me completely. Spirit, soul, and body. Why you say spirit? Because in my heart, I don't want to have any evil thing. I don't want to have jealousy. I don't want to have anger. I don't want to have any evil thing in my spirit. Soul, in my mind, my emotions. I want it to be holy. I want it to be consecrated. My body, whatever I say, whatever I do in my body, I want it to be consecrated. So I pray, oh God, sanctify me completely. Spirit, soul, and what? Keep my heart clean, keep my mind clean, keep my body clean, keep me clean. Sanctify me completely, spirit, soul, and body, so I can be blameless before God. I so you pray that prayer. Paul prayed this prayer. May the Lord sanctify you completely, preserve you, spirit, soul, and body, blameless before His coming. Right? So you pray that for yourself. Right? So that is the being sanctified part, how we live out our sanctified life. You are with me so far? Okay. So, uh, lesson number 42, you know, some common questions, you know, about, okay, so you're saying, if we have to live sanctified lives, you know, what is right, what is wrong, all those kinds of things. So, what about clothes, you know, attire? Uh, what about uh, clothes we wear? And uh, you know, we don't want to judge each other in clothes. You know, sometimes if somebody sees me like this, they say, what, you are teaching the Bible wearing jeans and shirt? What is this? So, you know, uh, some people won't accept that. Okay? So, uh, as long as, so, so we can't judge each other in clothes. Yeah? As long as you are doing, dressing modestly, clean, holy before God, it's fine. But also, be sensitive to which part of the world you're ministering, where you're ministering. Because in different cultures, uh, what is acceptable, not acceptable can vary. Right? Example, if you go from here to Malaysia, only three hours flight, as same as going from here to Delhi, three and a half hours for us. There, the weather is so hot. And it's just a common thing for people to be going on the streets, all, every, almost everyone wearing shorts. They come to church also, shorts. Can you imagine Sunday morning? Some people coming to church in? If you see in India, you say, man, that person is backslidden. <laughs> He's going to hell. Something like that. But there, Malaysia is very common. It's nice because weather is so hot. People are dressing to uh, according to their condition. Now they are good believers. 
Chinese, Indians. Just three hours from here, one flight. So Southeast Asia, wherever you go. Usually it's like that. The weather is hot and humid, so people wear those clothes and they walk. But you can't, if you do that here in Bangalore, they'll say, what is this gone? You know? So uh, we, we need to understand, like, um, in different parts of the world, people dress according to whatever the conditions are and all that. So don't judge people just because you see things. Now, obviously, we don't want anything that's obscene. We don't want anything that's uh, immodest. But also I understand that uh, what we say okay, not okay, may be different in a different culture, different country because of the weather. Weather thing is different. Right? So um, even for me, like you know, I have received some emails, you know, those about the shirts I wear and you know, people don't different people don't like different things. Then I finally said, I will wear what I want. If you like it, you don't like it, it's your headache. You know? As long as I know that I am wearing something that's modest, that is comfortable for me, it's fine. So why you don't wear suit? Why you don't wear tie? Well, where does the Bible say you have to wear suit and tie to preach the word? It's so hot as it is. <laughs> On top of that, you're wearing a suit and a tie. How? Just wearing shirt last Sunday was feeling hot in, <laughs> in the service. So on top of that, wear a suit and tie, how hot you'd feel. So just be comfortable. So different people judge you for all these things. But as long as you are, you know, uh, so careers, you know, what about careers like entertainment and fashion? You know, um, so as long as we, if, if, if God leads somebody to be involved in that sphere, entertainment, fashion, design. And as long as you as a believer are doing it in a way that glorifies God, there's nothing wrong. Because God needs people in those places, entertainment and fashion design and sports and arts. God needs people there to glorify his name. Right? For example, if we say, oh, Christians must not be involved in movies, then who would have made Jesus' film? A lot of Christian films. Who would have done that? Right? Or other movies that, that are clean and that are communicating a message. If we say Christians cannot be involved in movies, then who will make those movies? Jesus' film is the most watched film all over the world. Most translated film. There was a time when across all villages, people used to go and just play the Jesus film. People come and watch and they'll give their life to Jesus. But that's a movie. Somebody had to put it together just like how they make a movie. They had to make it. And they got it translated in so many languages. Right? And it's so powerful. I like that there are many other movies that are being made that are affecting culture, that are affecting the lives of people. So it's, we shouldn't say Christians can never be involved in movies because somebody's got to make good quality movies, Christian movies. So the point is, if you're involved in entertainment or those spaces, do it in a way that glorifies God. So uh, having speaking about the traditionals of clothes, uh, what about the First Corinthians chapter 11? We have some traditions in the Bible. What? Yeah, so about the head covering. Uh, if, you, if you look at the last verse there in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, uh, 33. Uh, 33, sorry, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 11. Uh, let me switch verse. I wanted to speak about this in, in the context of uh, head covering, right? Okay. Chapter 11. Yeah, Bible. verse 16. Right? Let's read verse 16. So 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 16, Paul is talking about head covering. How does he conclude that? Verse 16, he says, But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So what's Paul saying? 
if you want to argue this with me, this is what Paul is saying, right? If you, have, if you want to argue about covering head, should I cover head or should I not cover head? His conclusion, verse 16. If anyone seems contentious, since we don't have any custom like this, nor do the other churches of God. So that means this covering the head was specific to the Corinthian church. It was not for all the churches. Because he says clearly, nor do the churches of God. Other churches don't have this. And if you want to argue, he says, we have no such customs. I mean, this is a custom only for the Corinthians. We don't have it. Right. So uh, we will have, we, we're going to do a course um, on interpreting scripture. Right. Uh, I, I, I think it's in, I don't know, the second semester or second year, I forget. Huh? Interpreting scripture. We'll be doing a course. And there we will learn how to interpret scripture. There are some things in the Bible that are temporary in nature. That means it was given for a particular group of people or maybe for an individual. And it was only for them. It was not for everybody. Head covering is like that, one example. And we'll explain why. But it's very clearly stated here. Paul says, if anybody seems contentious about this, then we have no such custom, nor do the other churches. The other churches are not practicing this, and we don't have this custom. It's only for the Corinthian church. So it's not for us today. Now, if you want to cover your head, that's fine. It's up to you. Maybe to keep yourself warm or whatever. But it's not a requirement in Scripture. right? Um, for example, 1 Corinthians 14, he says, can you pray with a head with your head covered for them, you know, uh, uh, rather than this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, he says, can a man pray with his head covered? I said, no. But, he says, but then the, can you pray if you're wearing a hat, if you're wearing a helmet, do you pray? Of course you pray. Right? When you're riding your bike, you have a helmet, you're praying, praying in tongues. You know, so you have to understand that there are certain things that were given that are not permanent, that are temporary. For example, in the Old Testament, it says, you know, in the Old Testament, they had a practice that when you, when you sold a piece of land, you'll take off your shoe and give to the other person. We don't practice that today. If you give your shoe to somebody else, that's a, you keep your shoe, you sign here and give me the check. So th that's in the Bible. But we don't practice it. Why? That was a temporary thing. Paul wrote in Romans 16, he said, greet one another with a holy kiss. Are you going around everybody every day kissing? No. We don't practice that. That was for the Romans. But it's in the Bible. Greet one another with a holy. It's in the Bible. But we don't practice it. Why? It was for them in their culture. Right? So the Middle Eastern culture, even today, they will you know, hug like this three times. That was their culture. Today we may shake hands. I'll give a high five, something, namaskar, something. We greet a different way. Right? So many things. We'll talk about that in a separate course, how to understand the Bible correctly. But that will be the answer to that. Okay, so careers, you know, ch church stage decor. So some people don't like, you know, on the church stage, why you're putting LED? There's a holy must only have a wooden, where is the cross? Where is the wooden cross? All these things. So relax. The Bible says we worship God in spirit and truth. That is how we worship God. What the stage they call, there are certain reasons why we do certain things. You know, we, uh, we can have the LED so that we can project the scripture, we can project the words, people can see and sing. There are certain reasons. But that is not the main thing. The main thing is we worship God in spirit and True. So don't focus on that. We do certain things to make it uh, easy, appealing, convenient, etc. But that's not the focus because we know we worship God in spirit and truth. So states like, oh, you do what you want. You arrange it however you wish. But just don't make objects of worship on the stage record. Drinking alcohol. The Bible tells us, right? So again here, the Bible says don't get drunk. So some people will argue. The Bible only says don't get drunk. It doesn't say don't drink. 
So I will drink half glass. I'm not drunk. But it's true. You look at all the scriptures, it only says don't get drunk. It doesn't say don't drink. But you have to drink in order to get drunk. So what is our position? Our position is don't drink at all. Why? Because we know that if you have the habit of even drinking, say, little amount, that can lead to getting drunk. And sometimes if people are not able to control themselves, what will happen? In times of stress or being upset with something, they just go all the way, they get drunk. So our position is zero. Don't drink at all. But if you go to many parts of the world, not even outside India, in India only, bishops, archbishop, arch, arch, archbishop, drinking. Their argument is, uh, Bible doesn't say, don't drink, it says, don't get drunk. So I'm not getting drunk, so I will drink. So we won't argue with them. That's your position. Our position is, we will not drink anything. Yeah. Our response is the same thing, right? That, see, even wine, yeah, again, people will argue the same thing. I'm not getting, is wine you're drinking, you're not getting drunk. It's good for your health, good for your heart, this, that, and all they'll say. Our response is simple, right? See, even if we say okay to something like this, then we could, somebody in their time of stress, what will happen? Eh? They will go further and they get into trouble. So our thing is, don't. But, I won't judge if there's an asana, another person, he want, another believer, another preacher, another minister, he wants to drink wine or he wants to drink something. That's his choice. I don't judge. I think it's yeah, that's, that's their choice. It's fine. If it's fine for them, it's fine. That's their choice. Because somebody say, oh, Paul told Timothy, you know, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. So using that scripture, they'll drink a lot of it. So all these arguments, our position is just don't do it. Nothing. Stay completely free from all this. That's our position. But we won't judge somebody else. Who, and there are many preachers and pastors who have a different position. That's their position. Okay. Yeah. Food offered to idols. You know, again here, uh, the Bible tells us not to partake of this food offered to idols. And yet at the same time, we are not afraid because, suppose you go in the morning to eat masal dosa. Before you went to eat masal dosa, the restaurant owner did his puja already before you came. He did his puja for everything. You're going there and you're eating masal dosa. Are you afraid? You happily eat, you eat two masalas. <laughs> but he did his puja for the whole shop. You don't go eat masalas only in the Christian shop. Correct. But so, like that, you go buy vegetables, sabji. That man, before you came, only he did puja for his whole shop. He prayed over all his vegetables or whatever they're selling, right? They did their puja. But what did you, you buy it? Before you eat, you pray. So Paul said, First Timothy chapter 4. Right? Whatever is off, sold in the market, you buy. And you pray, and it is sanctified with the word of God, and pray. And you eat. But if somebody is giving you something offered to idols, then you say no, because, for two reasons. One, you don't want them to think that you're participating in their worship of their idols. And you don't want a weaker believer to think that. So for the sake of conscience, for the sake of not sending a wrong message, you say no. But you're not afraid of the banana. The banana is a banana is a banana. Doesn't matter how many times it went around the temple. Still only a it's not a demon possessed banana. <laughs> it's only a banana. But why we say no? Not because banana is demon possessed. No. We say no because we don't want to think that we are worshipping there. You don't want to send a wrong message. So you read this. First Corinthians 8, Romans 14, 
uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul explains this, right? So that's the reason we say no. Okay? But we're not afraid. He said, the food offered to an idol, is it anything? No. It's offered. We're not afraid of it. But there's a reason why we say no. Halba. I mean, if see, if somebody brings sweets, they bring ladoos, bring sweets, and all that. We don't know what all they've done before. You just pray, bless it, and eat it. So fine. So I did that only. Yeah, it's fine. But like everyone knew that it is on. It is like offered to their idols, and then they put it in dinner, like on some for the sweet. They put it in dinner. So, so I prayed over it, and I ate it. But some some people said that you should not eat it. They get this is not good. And uh, you don't make fun of the prayer that you are, you know that it is offered to an idol and you are praying over it and you ate it. So was that correct thing or not? Let's take an example. Suppose somebody has not eaten food for five days. And somebody comes and says, here's a banana. I have prayed over it. I did puja for five days. You want to eat it or not? If you're hungry, and that's the only thing in front of you, say, so Lord, I'm not afraid of how much puja they have done. I'm hungry now, I haven't eaten. <laughs> and you pray over it and eat it. Right? That's not, you're not afraid. Because you're not doing it to worship. You're just receiving it as a food. So, see, the thing is this. The main thing is fear. Right? If you're fearful, oh, you think demon Ladu is possessed. Four demons are inside the ladu. <laughs> if you think like that, if you are fearful, then the fear itself will open the door. The ladu is actually nothing, it's just a ladu. But the fear will open the door. So, yeah, you, you, you take it, you pray over it, and you eat it. It's not going to hurt you. What we don't want to do, as Paul explains, you know, is that we don't want to become a stumbling block to a weaker brother. How will it become a stumbling block to the weaker brother? Suppose that there's a new person in the faith. And they're seeing me eat something offered to idols. That person will think I am worshipping the idol. See, as long as I'm not communicating that message, that's the objective what Paul writes. And as long as I'm not communicating that message, I'm fine. So... You know, uh, sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't know it. But especially in the places where we live, people are, you know, doing all kinds of pujas for their shops and their food and things. We may know it, we may not know it. But what do we do? We just pray and we eat in faith. You're with me? Muslim. Ah, so the biryani during their festivals. Yeah. I happily eat it. <laughs> I don't know what they do, but then they bring, as friends, they bring, you know. I eat. Yeah. So we are not afraid. I mean, I mean, I don't want to go into too much of scripture. Yeah? First Timothy 4, Paul tells us, you know, you're sanctified, you're sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Yes. Oh, let's get the mic too. Yeah. 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 Pastor, you told that uh, that food which is made for idols, if you pray and eat in faith, nothing will happen, you told. But in my school days, I used to do night studies in schools, tuitions. When I go, I don't have anything to eat. I go to this temple, before that, uh, getting into saved. 
uh, before getting saved, I used to go to the temple and eat because I don't get any food. It, it, it was very late. I used to, Thursdays, the Sai Baba coil, they'll put something. I used to eat three, four uh, thing. <laughs> uh, after eating that, I got very sick for one week. I was not able to get up. I was bedridden like that. Uh, how could I take take it that in which thing? Yeah. So, see, one is uh, uh, you know uh, if a if a person doesn't believe like like the way you just just, just described, that means you're, you're not a believer. That means you don't. There is no faith involved, right? Um, so that means there is nothing protecting us, and we're not sanctifying that food that we're receiving. We're just receiving it. So then, yeah, obviously, either the food could be contaminated. That's, it could be a natural thing if it was not in a clean. Oh, it was very hot. It was very hot. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So, yeah. So maybe the food was either the food was say something wrong with the food, or yeah, that receiving of that food could open. It's, it's like a person saying. I'm receiving the power of those demons behind you know, this place of worship. And that happens many times. You know, so we're not, we're not saying there are no demonic powers associated with these things. We recognize it. But as believers, we're not afraid of it. Right? But if a person is not a believer, then yes, they are open to all kinds of things. And you know, we've heard so many stories. Like I remember once, yeah, in times past, we used to have a Nepali church, a Nepali congregation. And uh, there was once, uh, I, I, I don't think it was a person from the church, but you know, in that community, one person was just traveling by train. He was coming from uh, somewhere in the north, northeast, like uh, I think, where am I? He's coming by train, he's coming to Bangalore. On the train, somebody gave him cloth, black cloth. He just so from that moment on, he began. And then they got, yeah, yeah. So we asked, What happened? Oh, this this is all that happened. Yeah, a cloth he wiped on his face. Thing. So that's one thing. Then there are others in other times when you know people give some rose petals from the you know some place of worship. They put they say, oh, Keep it in your house. The person when he kept in the house, then she lost her mind. So we're not saying that uh, there are no demonic powers associated with it, but just that we are not afraid of it. As believers, uh, a food item, we cleanse it, we eat it. We're not afraid of it because it's not the food item itself. It's the worship behind what's happening right? that exposes people. To it. Uh, Pastor, one question. Uh, Paul clearly says that everything you eat, give thanks to the Lord and you can eat. Jesus also said, uh, like, uh, the things comes from outside will not affect you. Inside the heart, that uh, sexual immorality, th those things will affect will you. But uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 19 and 20, it says, like, the Spirit of the Lord uh, saying to the church in Theatara, I know your work, your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your later works exceed the first but i have this against you that you tolerate that woman jezebel who call herself a prophet prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols yeah yeah so uh, like what we are saying, sexual immor immorality is wrong. Eating food offered to, I'm not saying we should all go and eat food offered to idols. What I'm saying is, why are these people eating food offered to idols? It's an act of worship of the idol. So when you see all these people outside temple, they're standing there. The priest will come and put prasadam. And they're eating. What are they doing? It's an act of worship of the idol. But we don't do that. You're not receiving laddu. Give me laddu. <laughs> we are not doing that. Right? So here, it's clearly that this woman was 
encouraging people to actually worship, engage in idolatry by eating these, the food that was offered to. That's part of the worship of the idol, right? But we know that when we go to restaurants, when we go to other places, the owner is worshipping idols. He's, he's praying over everything, but we go and eat there. That is First Timothy 4. So I'm talking about, I'm not talking about Revelation 2.19, which this is an act of worship of the idol. I'm talking about First Timothy 4, where whatever is offered to idol, let's just turn there if you, before we close, uh, where when we eat things, we don't know. Right? So, um, I'm just, okay, uh, First Timothy 4 and uh, verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, for it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Right? So, um, so I'm talking about this, that when, when whatever food is given to you, we don't know what they've prayed over. We don't know whether they've offered it, they've done their pujas. What do you do? You receive it with thanksgiving, you pray over it, and you eat it. That's what I'm talking about. Not worship of idols. You understand? These are two different things. If you want to, or you can just say, no, thank you. Right? Yeah. So, like, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say, like, you know, okay, if you know they're giving you prasadam, you take it and... No, it says no thanks. Because there, you're taking your stand as a believer. I don't want to participate in this food, which I know is being given as an act of worship. And if I take it, then they think I'm worshipping their idol. And I want to make a stand very clear. I say, no, I, no thank you. But there are, they may come and give like a, during festival time, ladu or biryani or things like that, you know, which we don't know what they have done. But they're giving it as a friend. Or you go to a shop or a restaurant where you know people have done their pujas, but you're buying whatever is there. You pray over it and eat it. That means you're not doing it as an act of worship, although you know that it's an environment where there are people who worship, you know, but you're not afraid of that. That's the difference, right? So I'm not, if it is an act of worship, I will say no. But if it's just food that I have to eat for my body, I will say it. Okay, so don't get confused. I'm not saying go and eat uh, food offered to idols. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we're not afraid of those things. And if there's a need, I'm not afraid to take part of you know, a food which I can sanctify to the word of God. So main thing is this. Have no fear. And fear is what opens the door. If we are fearful, it will open the door. If we have faith, we stand protected. Okay. There are a couple of other small things I just wanted to cover. Our next lesson is very important. This is section 5, being identified with Christ. Uh, we'll pick that up next week. Okay. Let's stop here. You can go for your break. Right, thank you.